Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. I'm Barry Bryson, and we're uh, continuing our study of the book of Jude today as part of our larger conversation about the neglected books of the New Testament. And today we're finishing the body of the letter, looking at verses 17 through 23. The body of the letter is in three sections. The first section is, this is what God does. The second section is, this is what the false teachers are doing and who they are. And the third section is, this is what you need to do. What God does is he brings judgment upon the wicked. Uh, and then the second part is, this is what they do. The various ways in which they are wicked, and wicked in ways we recognize from our past and from scripture. And this is the section in which he defines what he means when he tells them in verse 3, to contend earnestly for the faith. And it's not so much going to war as strengthening yourselves and intervening in the lives of others. Let's read verses 17 to 23. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear hating even the garment polluted by sin. It doesn't sound like in this passage he's told them to give up on anybody, does he? Although there's love and then there's intervention and then there's tough love envisioned in all of this. But that's the first thing I want us to notice. Contending for the faith doesn't mean coming out with both fists swinging. It means making yourself strong and rescuing others. Uh, and, and not giving up on anybody. Sometimes it means, you know, to, to, to be, to be um, the EMT, to be the triage uh, person. Sometimes it means to, to be the rescue guy that goes into the flames to pull someone out of it. And sometimes it's just worrying and praying and biding your time as you hate the garment of sin, but you, you, you continue personally to have mercy upon the person whom you know is living in sin until you have the opportunity to snatch them from the fire. Let's look um, more deeply about the things that he tells them. Verse 17, you beloved ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about the, the overlap of Jude and 2 Peter and about two thirds of the book of Jude is either <laughs> directly lifted or strongly referencing Second Peter, uh, and we talked about why that might be, addressing similar issues, certainly both inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that one probably had access to the others, to the other. And I think this is one of the reasons why I think Jude is later, because to me, verse 17 says that Jude is written at a later date, when Jude can look back on the bulk of the New Testament having been already written, and talk about that which was once for all delivered and talk about the work of the apostles in the past tense, which it largely was. By the end of the first century, there really was only one surviving member of the apostles and only one surviving member of that first generation, and that is John the Apostle. So I think this is written at a later date. And he says they've already said these things, and he, he gives us a direct quote in verse 18. And that's a, a quote, it seems to be, from either 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 or 2 Peter 2 verse 1 or an apostolic letter that is lost to us, like a letter to the Laodiceans or something. But he gives us a, a quote that seems to strongly reference two passages, but not to directly quote either one. So maybe it's from a text that we don't have anymore. And he tells us, you know, that these folks are going to be this way. Of course, every biblical writer tells, every New Testament writer tells us that. So this is connected to so many other passages. These are ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Now, again, describes them in three ways. So far, we've had the Father and the Son mentioned, but not the Spirit. But here at the end, we get the Spirit in good measure. 
because these people are devoid of the Holy Spirit, whereas you are not devoid of the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them to build themselves up on their faith, not the faith, but their faith, the faith they have inside, the absolute trust and dependence they have upon God. And then he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? Does that mean to reach some sort of an ecstatic state? I think not. I think he really is referencing the very thing Paul is describing in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, when he says that none of us know how to pray as we ought. We don't have the words. We don't have the way to express to God what we need to, but that's okay, because the Spirit communicates for us in utterances that are too deep for words. I think he's talking about the very thing Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8. And, and then he, he, he calls upon us not to give up on anybody, but to use our discernment. You know, not everyone who's sick needs penicillin. Not everyone who's sick needs an aspirin. Some people can't take aspirin. I can't take NSAIDs anymore for the rest of my life. So you, you can't just no, treat everyone the same. Who, who happens to need your intervention, your advice, your, your counsel, your love. Some people we, we, we have mercy on who are doubting and we treat them delicately. Some people need an intervention. You snatch them from the fire. And, and that, that seems to be a quote from Amos chapter 4, verse 11, and a reference to the rescue of, uh, of Lot, which is all, he's also referenced in 2 Peter. Uh, and then others... You hate the garment polluted by sin. He uses hate, not for the sinner, but for the sin, the garment polluted by sin. But you in your heart continue to have mercy for that person. And it seems to be saying, biding your time until you can snatch them out of the fire uh, if that opportunity presents itself. But you don't give up on anyone. Uh, a lot of people see Jude as a, as a judgment oracle. I think ultimately it's an oracle of grace. It says that salvation by grace is always possible. You're saved. Yes, you can turn your back on your salvation, but that's your choice. And people who have done that or are about to do that can make a different choice. And it's your responsibility to take responsibility for, for helping them when they're making bad choices. And it's not one size fits all. You can't just pronounce judgment on everybody. And you can't just coddle everybody either. Use your discernment the discernment that love gives you and that your faith gives you and your knowledge of the faith gives you and act appropriately. It's, it's timeless, timeless instruction from God's word. And I hope we listen very closely to it and live by it. We're going to um, look at the conclusion of the letter and the, the body of the text tomorrow. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the word.